Good day, brothers and sisters in the faith, and welcome to the BQA, a program brought to you by the Assembly of Yahushua. For today's episode, we're going to be answering a question from one of our viewers concerning the work of proclaiming the name Yahuwah by the Assembly of Yahushua and its connection with Yahuwah's work concerning the nation of Israel. Now, before we go ahead and proceed to answer this question, let us first offer a prayer of thanksgiving. Everlasting Father, most holy and gracious Abba Yahuwah, we gather before you once again to call upon your precious name, Yahuwah, a name filled with power and love. We cling to you, O Abba, because we firmly believe that you will rescue and deliver your people so that we will find eternal rest in your holy abode. May you be with us in the study of your holy words. We believe that you have called us to rehearse our faith and in so doing, we shall re receive the reward that you have promised your people. Our King Yahushua, may you please be with your servants today. Be with us as we search the scriptures. May you guide us with the power of your Holy Spirit so that we can remain faithful and loyal to you. We believe, Father, that you have listened to our prayers and you have forgiven completely our sins. For we ask and beg everything in the name of our Lord and Savior, Yahushua HaMashiach. Amen. Okay, praises be to our loving Father that we are again given this precious opportunity to spend some time together to study the words of our Father Yahuwah. Our topic for today, for today is quite interesting. It actually comes from one of our brothers who view uh, the Assembly of Yahusha, members of the Assembly, and this is what he has to say, first in Tagalog, and then we translate it in English. May patotoo ba ng Biblia ang gawain ng Assembly of Yahusha na tumatawag kay Yahuwa sa mga huling panahon na ito, at ano ang kaugnayan nito sa huling gawain ni Yahuwa na nauukol sa bayang Israel. And so the translation is in English. Does the Bible testify about the assembly of Yahushua's work of proclaiming the name of Yahuwa during the end times? And what is its connection to Yahuwa's work regarding the nation of Israel? And so this question is pretty much twofold. First is the work of the assembly in proclaiming the name of the Father. And what is its connection with the work of Yahuwah's present restoration of the nation of Israel? And so to address this question, let us first understand the purpose of prophecy. Let's read the book of Acts 3, 19 and 21. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Yahushua. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy 
prophets. Now, what I read to you is a revelation from the Apostle Peter. Take note, this took place during the day of Pentecost. And who was his immediate audience? The people of Israel. Remember, when Yahuwah created man, it was for the purpose of living forever. Mankind failed. And so Yahuwah initiated the work of redemption and restoration. And so in the work of restoration, it involves many promises of God. Yahuwah makes a covenant. And when he makes a covenant and a promise, he will fulfill them. So he makes a promise. He will restore everything. And this centers around the restoration of Israel as well. Because the Bible, after all, is Israel-centric. It is from Israel for Israel. And we who are Gentiles are grafted to Israel through Yahushua our king. And so when it comes to the work of restoration at the center is the people of Israel. This is why when we look at the question, what is the work of the, what, how does the work of proclaiming the name Yahuwah that we do in the assembly of Yahushua, how does that connect to Yahuwah's work regarding the nation of Israel? This is why we must first look at the history of Israel so that we can understand how the proclaiming of God's name fits in the work of restoration. So how did Israel first come to be? Let's read here in the book of Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Now Yahuwah had said to Abram, take note, his name wasn't yet Abraham. He was a pagan at this point. He was Abram. And so now Yahuwah had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless, who bless you. And I will curse those who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so what we read is a promise and a calling of God. Who does Yahuwah God call in this passage? Abram. Abram was a pagan. He did not know God. But God calls him. And because of faith, what does Abram do? He leaves his homeland to the land Yahuwah God has chosen for him. And in so doing, he makes a promise, a sevenfold promise to Abram. What are they? I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. I will make you a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. In you, all the families of the earth shall be Blessed. Remember, in the overall plan of God, he's going to restore everything. But in so doing, he decides or chooses to do it through Abraham. This is why in number seven, it says, In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so the plan of God from the very beginning in choosing Abraham is to bless the whole world through Abraham. Now, how is God going to do this? How is God going to bring blessing upon the whole earth through Abraham? Bible says he will make him into a great nation. And so it is through Yahuwah God's work of making Abraham, Abraham into a great nation will this prophecy be fulfilled. And so when you look at these promises, have, were they, are they completely fulfilled today? Partly, right? But you can't say it's like a complete fulfillment. And in many of the prophecies of God in the Old Testament, many of them are only partially completed. They await a more complete fulfillment in the future. And this is always the case when it comes to many of the prophecies of our almighty God. So this is a premise that he gave to Abram. And so after receiving this promise, do you know what Abram does? Well, in the next verse, it says that Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the Terebinth tree of Moreh, 
and the Canaanites were then in the land. Then Yahuwah appeared to Abram and said to your descendants, I will give you this land. And there he built an altar to Yahuwah who had appeared to him. And so to fulfill his promise in making Abram into a great nation, he also promised a piece of land. Because how can you be a great nation if you don't have land? And so the land was given to Abram as a promise. And this was in Canaan. And so he tells them to go to Shechem. There is Shechem, by the way. It's right in the middle of Canaan. He tells them to go to Shechem. And then he tells them to look north, look south, look east, look west. And all the lands that you see, that's going to be the land to be given to your descendants because you're going to be made into a great nation. And so after receiving the promise of becoming a great nation, to becoming a source of blessing to all families throughout the earth, to be promised to be given all this land, what does Abram do? He builds an altar to Yahuwah and called on the name of Yahuwah. You see, what we know from the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they all called on the name of Yahuwah. They worship Yahuwah. And so Abram builds an altar and he's given the promise to look everywhere, and that land will be given to you. And because of this, they praise and worship Yahuwah, which tells us the patriarchs indeed knew, knew the name of Yahuwah and called upon his name. Now, when, we, when it comes to the land that was promised by Yahuwah Abba to Abram, the Bible says these are the boundaries from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. And so when we look at the map, that means the land promised to Abram would include all of this land that you see in the green. You compare that to Israel today in the yellow, and you can see it's only a sliver of what was promised to Abram and his descendants. So we know Yahuwah God is not yet finished with his work. The prophecy, the promise, it's still ongoing. It awaits a complete and future fulfillment. This is why we know Yahuwah is still in the work of restoring his people Israel. However, after giving this promise to Abraham, it's kind of a he, he gives like a, a detail, like a fine print detail. Abraham is told you're going to inherit all this land, but for 400 years. Your descendants will be a stranger in that land, and they're going to be afflicted. In other words, he's going to wait before the promise is going to be fulfilled. Truth of the matter is, Abram would not even see the fulfillment of the promise in his own lifetime. But Abram was told to go to the land of promise, which is kind of unusual. Why would Yahuwah God tell Abram? To go to the land of promise and say to him, well, your descendants will inherit this hundreds of years after you die. Right? Why was this done? Let's read the book of Hebrews 11, 8 to 10. It was faith that made Abraham obey when God called him to go out to a country which God had promised to give him. He left his own country without knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as a foreigner in the country that God had promised him. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who received the same promise from God. For Abraham was waiting for the city, which God has designed and built, the city which with permanent foundation. So why was Abraham called to live in the land of promise, even though in the land of promise he was to live as a foreigner, as a pilgrim? That's because Abram was called to rehearse his faith. When he obeyed and said to God, yes, I will go to the promised land. I'm going to leave my homeland. I'm going to leave my ancestors to, the go, to, to go to the land that you have promised, even if it meant not knowing what is at store, what is in store for me. And so he lived in the land of promise, but it wasn't his yet. And so this tells us about the importance of rehearsing our faith. And so if we know Yahuwah was going to do something in the future, right? And we are included in that future. 
what we ought to do if we truly believe in God's promises is to rehearse our faith. Abram was called to rehearse his faith. We too are called to rehearse our faith because we too have a promise from God. This is what we're going to study a little later on. So Abram was living in Canaan for for several for his lifetime, the rest of his lifetime, waiting for the promise to be fulfilled. And then he dies. And then who's next? Isaac. And then after Isaac, Jacob. We know what happened to Jacob's son, Joseph. The trials and tribulation he went through, but it was all part of God's plan so that he can position and place Joseph to be a governor in Egypt. And so before Jacob dies, all of Jacob's tribes, they migrate to Egypt. They have a nice place in Goshen. And so they live there and prosper there. They multiply greatly there. They repopulated at a very fast rate in Egypt. But one day, a pharaoh who did not know Joseph comes and they oppress the people of Israel because they were growing so fast and he was afraid. And so what do they do? They enslave the people of Israel to fulfill the promise to fulfill what Yahuwah said, that is the descendants of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, would be afflicted for over 400 years. And so the waiting continues for the promise and the prophecy to be fulfilled. So 400 years of oppression, 400 years of slavery, the people of God, what do they do? Well, they begin to cry out to God. They cry out to Abba, right? And so when they cry to God, Hundreds of years later, how does God respond? Exodus 3, 9 to 11. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. Who is the one speaking here? God, Yahuwah, our God. The cry of the Israelites has reached me. And I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Who is Yahuwah God speaking to? Moses. And so here's the people of Israel. And they're enslaved by Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And so what Yahuwah God is telling Moses, I'm sending you to deliver the slaves, the Israelites, from this powerful country called Egypt, who with a powerful leader who is the Pharaoh. I'm sending you, Moses. You're going to deliver Israel. And so what does Moses say? But Moses said to God, Who am I? That I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. This was one of the most famous lines from Moses, right? Who am I that you would send me? This tells us about the humility of Moses. And so when Moses gives this reply, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? What does God say to him? Well, he says, and God said, I will be with you. You see, what Yahuwah God tells us to do something, you know what that means? It's an invitation for us to go with, to be with him. When Yahuwah God tells us to do something, it means he's going to be with us to do the work through us. And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? And so here's Moses. He's given the impossible task of liberating the people of Israel from Egypt. And God says and assures him, I'm going to be with you. But Moses, he wants to convince the people of Israel so that they can work together. But for him to convince people of Israel, he knows they're going to ask, well, what's his name? <laughs> what will I ask? What will I say to them? Moses says to God, if they ask for your name. And so what does God say? How does God introduce himself to Moses? Let's read the book of Exodus 3, 14 and 15. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, Yahuwah, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob 
has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. And so when, Moses, when God introduces himself to Moses, and when he answers the question that Moses had, he begins by saying who he is. What did he say? I am who? I am. That's the first time God reveals himself in that manner. He says, I am who I am. What does that mean? I am who I am. Ahaya, Asher, Ahaya, right? And so he's telling him the meaning of his name. But what is his actual name? Yahuwah. And so tell him, he told Moses, Moses, this is my name. I am, who, this is my name, Yahuwah. This is my name forever. Yahuwah, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And the meaning of his name is, I am who? I am. That's a big distinction. That's an important distinction. Remember, Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, did they call upon the name of Yahuwah? Yes. But when they called upon the name of Yahuwah, they did not know what it meant. They did not know, I am who I am. What's the proof? Exodus 6 through the 4, and God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am Yahuwah. I appear to Abram and Isaac and Jacob as God Almighty, but my name, Yahuwah, I was not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage in which they were strangers. And so the Bible tells us that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God appeared to them, but even though they called upon his name, they did not know his name. There's a big difference because one can call upon a name without knowing the meaning of the name. Yahuwah God does not disclose to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the meaning of his name. But to Moses, it's different. Moses was given not only the name, but the meaning of his name. I am who? I am. Why? Why does Yahuwah give to Moses the name Yahuwah and the meaning of the name Yahuwah? I am who I am. Well, the answer is found in 16 and 17. Now go and call together all the elders of Israel. Tell them, Yahuwah, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me. He told me, I have been watching closely and I see how the Egyptians are treating you. I have promised to rescue you from your oppression in Egypt. I will lead you to a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hevites, and Jebusites now live. I want to pause here for a while, beloved brethren. Do you see why Yahuwah God did not get revealed the meaning of the name I am, who I am, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? But he revealed it to Moses. When Yahuwah God gave the promise to Abraham, what did he say? Your descendants, hundreds of years from now, are going to inherit the land flowing with milk and honey. But not now. Time will come in the future. That will happen. That promise I made will be fulfilled. But not now, Abraham. Not now, Isaac. Not now. Jacob, in the future, it will be fulfilled, but not now. When it was time for the prophecy to be fulfilled, when it was time for the people of Israel to go to the land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hevites, and Jebusites now live, which was promised by God to Abraham in Genesis 15. And Yahuwah says, you need to know the meaning of my name. And that's why when Yahuwah God gave the meaning of the name, Yahuwah, I am who I am to Moses, it was because the fulfillment of that promise and prophecy was near. It's about to be fulfilled. And so Yahuwah God says to them, you've waited for many years. Now it's going to be fulfilled. So when you study, when we study scripture, it's often the case that Whenever God does something, 
he reveals a name or changes a name or gives a new name, right? For example, when they were going to, when they were about to enter the promised land, he tells Moses to change the name of Hosea to Yahusha, remember? From Husha to Yahusha. And in many cases also, when God was going to fulfill the promise to Abram that he will be the father of many nations, what does he do? No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. God made a promise long ago to Abram that you're going to be a father of many nations, but he waits like 25 years. And when it was time for him to receive the promise, he does something with the name. What does he do? He changes the name from Abram to Abraham. Why does he do that? Well, if you look at the meaning of Abram, it means exalted father. When it was time for the promised son to be fulfilled, he says, okay, Abram to Abraham, which means a father of a multitude or chief of multitude. And so he changes the name to signify that a promise is about to be fulfilled. The promised son is going to be given to Sarai. And so Sarai's name is also changed from Sarai to Sarah, because she shall be a mother of nations, from princess to noble woman. And so Yahuwah gives us clues. Yahuwah likes to use names as markers, which lets us know when he's going to fulfill something great. And so when he reveals a name or changes a name, we know that soon something is going to happen. Something great is going to happen. In this case, when Yahuwah God reveals to Moses the meaning of his name, the 400 years of waiting, is about to come to a conclusion because Israel is going to be set free and they will go to the land of promise. Through who? Moses. What will Moses do? Set the people free so that the people of Israel will become the people of God, a nation of Israel. This is why he tells Moses, this is my name. I am who I am. Why is it significant to know the name? I am who I am. Because when you look at the Hebrew word, I, the Hebrew ayah, which forms the main word of I am who I am, when you combine it together, it communicates different layers of meaning, which tells us about the commitment of Yahuwah, that he is the one who causes all things to exist, who is ever present, who will be with you, Moses, who will help you, who enters into a covenant, and he will carry it out to completion. He will save you and deliver you. That's the meaning of Ahaya, Asher, Ahaya. This is why we know Moses was given the assurance. I'm giving you my name. This is like the assurance that I will not leave you. I will be with you. And because you have obeyed me, the people of Israel will be delivered and become the people of God. So when Yahuwah revealed his name, and its meaning to Moses, the promise he made to Abraham, was soon fulfilled afterwards. They would enter the promised land. They would become a nation. Now, this leads us to our next question. Why does God set apart Israel to become his nation, to become his people in the first place? What is Jehovah's purpose in setting free Israel and making it a nation? If you still remember the sevenfold promise that Yahuwah God made to Abraham, to Abram, he said, I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to make all families be blessed through you. You see, the intent and purpose for the nation of Israel was to be the messenger to the world. That's what God wanted from Israel. Unfortunately, Israel failed. They were unable to be the light, the beacon of hope for all mankind. They failed to do that. That was the plan. They were supposed to be the kingdom of priests. They were supposed to lead all these nations to blessing because they will bring people to understand God. And so the purpose of Yahuwah in setting free the people of Israel from the clutches of Pharaoh 
was so that his name would be made great. Take a look at Romans 9, verse 17. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. See, that was the purpose of God in creating the nation of Israel so that the name of Yahuwah would be proclaimed throughout the whole, the whole earth. Was that ever fulfilled? Was the name of God that his name would be proclaimed throughout the whole earth, was that fulfilled? It was not. It wasn't fulfilled at all. In fact, it was stymied by Israel itself. We'll find out later on. But remember, one of the purposes for why Yahuwah God created the nation of Israel in the first place was so that people would come to know Yahuwah because Israel, as the messenger to the world, would proclaim Yahuwah so that the whole world will worship and recognize Yahuwah. But Israel did not do that. Even during the days of the kingdom, they did not bring glory to the name of Yahuwah. Instead, what did they do? How long will this be in the heart of the prophets who prophesy lies? Indeed, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart who try to make my people forget my name by their dreams, which everyone tells his neighbor. As their fathers forgot my name for Baal. Here we have Jeremiah. We call him the weeping prophet because when he was called to be a prophet, he was the prophet of doom and gloom because the people of Judah, Israel were already captives. Judah were the ones left standing. But Judah remains faithless even after the captivity of Israel. And so Jeremiah is telling the people, you better change your ways because Yahuwah God is about to punish you. And then he accuses these false prophets that Jeremiah was surrounded with because the people of Israel, did, the people of Judah did not believe Jeremiah because all these other false prophets were telling the opposite of what Jeremiah was saying. And so they believed these false prophets. The false prophets tried to make them forget the name of Yahuwah because the people of Judah well, they were into idol worship. They worshiped who? Baal. This is why Yahuwah says to Jeremiah, my people forget my name, just like their fathers forgot my name for Baal. And so there was, there was this ongoing apostasy. Israel and Judah, the two kingdoms of, the, of all Israel, they were rejecting Yahuwah. They forgot the name of Yahuwah. Israel betrayed Yahuwah and worshiped other gods. Because of, because of this, Yahuwah permitted them to be captives in Assyria and Babylon. And when they were in captivity, of course, the name of Yahuwah was blasphemed. But Yahuwah still has a plan to restore his people, Israel. Look at Isaiah 52, 46. This is what the sovereign Yahuwah says. Long ago, my people chose to live in Egypt. Now they are oppressed by Assyria. What is this? Asks Yahuwah. Why are my people enslaved again? Those who rule them uh, shout in exaltation. My name is blasphemed all day long. But I will reveal my name to my people. And they will come to know its power. And at last, they will recognize that I am the one who speaks to them. And so the people of Israel, who were supposed to be the messengers of Yahuwah, the proclaimers of the name of Yahuwah, they failed. They become captives, Israel first, and then Judah next. When they were captives, the name of Yahuwah was blasphemed. But does Yahuwah give up on Israel? No. Yahuwah God plans to deliver Israel. And sure enough, this is what happens. And Yahuwah has a promise, I will reveal my name to my people, and they will come to know its power. So after the captivity, was that fulfilled? Was the purpose of Israel fulfilled? Remember, the purpose of Israel was to proclaim the name of Yahuwah, so that all of the earth would know it. They failed to do that. And after the captivity, what did they learn from the Babylonians? Let's read. 
from the Jewish encyclopedia concerning the Tetragrammaton, the avoidance of the original name of God, Yahuwah, both in speech and to a certain extent in the Bible, first arose in Babylonia. When they get to Babylon, they learn the custom of the Babylonians. And so after they were set free from Babylon, the remnants who were set free, they adopted a custom. They adopted a superstition. What is that superstition? They adopted the avoidance of pronouncing and calling upon the name of God, the name Yahuwah. This started in Babylonia. But the truth of the matter is, it's not only the Babylonians who had such superstitions. Many others had such superstitions. And because of the superstition, according to Herodotus, Marduk was therefore a very important god of Babylon. In the first millennium BCE, his name was considered so holy that it was almost never pronounced. Instead, people said and wrote Bel, Lord. Herodotus correctly calls the supreme god of Babylon Bel, Lord, because his real name was not pronounced. When we have the Hebrew scriptures and we look at Baal, and then we, we understand that to be the name of the Babylonian god, in the Babylonian way of seeing things, Baal is actually not a proper name. Baal is actually a, 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 a common name, Lord. That's what it means, Lord. This is why when we read Baal, we say, what does Baal mean? Lord, because that comes from the Babylonian literature. In the Babylonian literature, the actual personal name of Baal is actually what? Marduk. And so ba the Babylonians were the ones who invented replacing the actual name of their deity with a, with a placeholder. And in this case, it was Lord, Baal or Bel. And so when the Hebrews were writing about these Babylonian gods, they wrote Bel, which means actually in the Babylon, according to the Babylonians, is actually not a proper name at all. It was a name, it was a noun that meant Lord. Okay, that's because the Babylonians believe you're supposed to cover, you're not supposed to use the actual name of God. So when the Israelites came out of the Babylonian captivity, they brought along with them the Babylonian culture, along with its Babylonian beliefs and superstitions. One of these pagan Babylonian practices or beliefs was called ineffability. How many of you have heard of ineffability? Because this is what the Jews would tell you. The name of God is ineffable. If you go to Israel today and you call on the name Yahuwah, they will say, no, don't say that. That's a bad word. Don't say that word because that's the name of God. Don't say that. They say it is ineffable. What does that mean? This was the superstition against using the name of a deity for fear of something bad happening to them. The idea was that if you said the name of a deity, he or she would notice you. And when he notices you, it's not in a good way. It's in a bad way. And so he's going to notice you and he's going to pick on you, basically. This is the idea of God, according to the Babylonians. Very different from God, according to the Hebrew scripture. So the, the pagan practice of ineffability was further reinforced by Greek Hellenization. And so the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, they all practice this concept of ineffability, the unutterable name of God. And so during the days when Yahushua was under the rule of the Greeks and the, and the Romans, ineffability was in full swing. And so they take the name of God. This is why when you look at old scriptures, They've already practiced replacing as early as 150 AD. They began replacing the actual name of God with names like uh, God or Lord Adonai instead of the actual name. And so people of Israel, what were they supposed to do again? They were supposed to proclaim the name of Yahuwah, but they failed to do that. They hid the name of Yahuwah under the guise of ineffability. So you would think by now, Yahuwah God is really upset. 
and rightly so, but Yahuwah God in his mercy, because he is Yahuwah, he doesn't give up on Israel. Despite all of that, Yahuwah sends who? According to the promise. Yahusha, right? Therefore God has, therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name, which is above every name. That at the name of Yahusha, every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Yahushua, Christ is Lord, to the glory of God, the Father. And so now, Yahuwah, so that he can restore Israel, he gives them his only begotten son. And gives them the name, Yahushua, which exhibits the love of Abba. Through Yahushua, he will save Israel and all of mankind to fulfill his promise to Abraham. Remember the sevenfold promise? How through Abraham... The people of the world can be blessed. That can be done through Yahusha. Because Yahusha is the seed of Abraham. And so he gives Yahusha. But what does Israel do to Yahusha? What do they do? They reject Yahusha. They kill and crucify Yahusha. And so what happens to the people of Israel? In 70 AD, the temple, Jerusalem, was destroyed. Israel dispersed. It ceased to be a nation i mean during the days of christ on earth at least they were a nation i mean they were subjects but they still were a nation but after this they were not even considered a nation because they all dispersed they had no land they had no temple they had no identity israel was gone and we should not be surprised that this is happening because if you were reading your daily bible you would have already finished the book of leviticus and if you have read Leviticus 26, you will see the warning of God and what would happen to Israel. And you saw like the sevenfold punishments of God, what would happen, how Israel would be destroyed, dispersed and scattered and suffer diseases. But if you notice in Leviticus, despite all of that, this is what Yahuwah says. Take a look in Leviticus. But despite all this, I will not utterly reject or despise them yet yahuwah was i mean if you read leviticus all of leviticus 26 you will see the punishments of israel one after the other because they kept forgetting god they kept doing the things god was against but you so yahuwah punishes them but then he says but despite all this i will not utterly reject or despise them while they are in exile in the land of the enemies even today Right in, in the early 1940s and before that, people of Israel were in exile in many different nations. But even while they are in exile in the land of enemies, the Bible says, I will not utterly reject them. I will not cancel my covenant with them by wiping them out. For I am the Lord their God. For their sakes, I will remember my ancient covenant with their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of all the nations, that I might be their God. I am Yahuwah. He remembers his covenant. And he also remembers one of the things that Israel is supposed to do. What is that again? Proclaim the name of Yahuwah. So that all the earth will know the name Yahuwah. And so despite all this, Yahuwah still is going to restore Israel. And he will continue to restore everything as he promised long ago. So we know right before the end comes, we're going to see the fruit of the beginning work of restoration. Romans 11, 25 to 27. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be Say, as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And so according to Apostle Paul, yes, Israel rejects Messiah. But according to Apostle Paul, after this period of blindness is finished and the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, what will happen to all Israel? Eventually, the Bible says they will also be saved and so that's going to be fulfilled and so when yahuwah god gives a promise because when all israel is all israel is saved that's a big thing 
a preview to the big thing is what Yahushua spoke about when the fig tree prophecy was fulfilled. Remember the fig tree prophecy, Matthew 24, 32, 34. Now learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know that summer is near in the same way when you see all these things, you can know his return is very near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass from the scene until all things take place. And so before that day comes, when Israel, all Israel will be saved, before that day comes, we're going to see a sign. What is that sign? We're going to see the fig tree, its branches bud, its leaves begin to sprout. We've studied this prophecy before. The fig tree represents Israel. Israel ceased to be a nation because it was cursed by Yahushua. However, this curse would be lifted and Israel would again become the tree. But it's not yet producing the figs, but it's beginning to bud. The leaves are beginning to sprout. And so we see that before it's completely fulfilled, we will see signs of its fulfillment. Small occurrences, small victories, small events that point to a bigger victory, a bigger event. You see that? And so it buds, but it's not yet the full fig tree. And so when it buds, you know there's going to be a full fig tree coming soon. This is why when this prophecy was fulfilled, the budding of the fig tree, the initial small fulfillment of a much bigger fulfillment, well, that took place in May 14, 1948, when Israel became a nation. And then Jerusalem was restored to Israel in 1967. And so this was fulfilled. And according to Yahushua, when that's fulfilled, when you see the branches bud and the leaves begin to sprout, fulfilled in 1948, Yahushua says, that generation will not pass from the sea until all these things take place. In other words, that generation, which observed and saw and witnessed the coming together of the nation of Israel, that generation is called the last generation. Brethren, we're living in the last generation. And so what Yahuwah God did with Israel is a sign of bigger things to come. It's just a sample of bigger things to come. In, in, a, word, in a word, we're seeing like uh, the light. Imagine like it's nighttime and dawn is about to break. You initially see a small, a small light and then the light begins to, begins, begins to grow, become stronger. It becomes like daylight. That's kind of what is happening now. Light is breaking through. Prophecy and restoration is breaking through. But it begins with the fig tree. It's bud beginning to, I mean, it's branches beginning to bud. It's leaves beginning to sprout. And so we know this is the last generation. Now, here's something wonderful. Remember Yahuwah's purpose for why he called Israel? Israel is supposed to be the messenger to preach and proclaim who? Yahuwah, right? And so in the last generation, what is the intent and purpose of Yahuwah. Let's read the book of Psalms, 102, 1622. For Yahuwah will reveal Zion and appear in his glory. It's going to happen in the future. He will respond to the prayer of the destitute. He will not despise their plea. Let this be written for a last generation. That a people not yet created may praise Yahuwah. The Bible says, let this be written. For a last generation. Who's included in that last generation? That's us. This was written for us. Because we are in the last generation. This was written for us. So that we may praise and exalt who? Yahuwah. What was written for us? That we might praise Yahuwah. That word last. When it says last generation. It's an interesting Hebrew. It's an interesting uh, Hebrew word. Because it's from Aharon, which means last. 
So it's speaking about the last generation. And the last generation, this is uh, what is written for us. So the name of Yahuwah will be declared in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem when the peoples and the kingdoms assemble to worship Yahuwah. You see, Yahuwah's purpose, which is why he set apart Abraham and Israel becoming the source of blessing for all people and all kingdoms, the only way for the people to receive that blessing from Yahuwah is by worshiping who? Yahuwah. And so what is the will of Yahuwah in the last generation, which is why this is written? We have to declare the name of Yahuwah. Why is that so significant? That's because in Isaiah 52, the prophecy which is yet to be fulfilled is about to be fulfilled. And so the big fulfillment of this passage here is going to begin as a small light, a small awakening. People are going to know the name of God. Because Yahuwah says, I will reveal my name to my people. And they will recognize and they will come to know its power. And so in preparation for when God restores everything, Yahuwah wants us to proclaim his name. Why? Because before Yahuwah, God does something in fulfillment of a promise. What does he do first? He declares his name. He did that to Abraham. He did that to Sarah. He did that to Moses. Before he gives or before he delivers, before he fulfills his promise, he's going to have his name proclaimed. Why? So that Yahuwah gets the glory. This is why we have to establish the name. We proclaim the name. So he gets the glory. Yahuwah. And our king, Yahusha. And who is Yahuwah going to use in these last days? Because this is for the last generation. This was not fulfilled already. This is going to be fulfilled in the last generation. Who will be the instruments of Yahuwah to reveal the name of Yahuwah Abba. If we go to the book of Acts, and I know you know this passage very well. In the last days, God says, I will pour my spirit on everyone. Your sons and daughters will speak what God has revealed. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour my spirit on my servants and both men and women. They will speak what God has revealed. I will work miracles in the sky and give signs on the earth. Blood, fire, and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will become as red as blood before the terrifying day of Yahuwah comes. And so do you know when this prophecy was first fulfilled? Yeah, day of Pentecost. Do you see the quotes after 17? Yeah. Apostle Peter is actually quoting. Apostle Peter, on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit was poured upon them, he was quoting prophecy. What prophecy was he quoting? Joel. Yeah. And he said, Joel's prophecy is beginning to be fulfilled. And so during the Pentecost, this prophecy was already in its initial Fulfillment. And so the spirit was poured upon the people there, beginning with the Israelites. But we know when we jump to the book of Acts 10, this prophecy expanded to include everyone. The Jews first and then the Gentiles. Everyone. But this work of the Holy Spirit, the pouring of the spirit, is also going to go all the way. Up until when? The day before the day of Yahuwah comes. And so before the judgment day comes, the, the Holy Spirit's work is continuous. It doesn't stop. It's continuous. The work of the Spirit from Pentecost on is continuous for those who belong to our King, Yahusha. And towards the latter parts of the last days, the last generation, what is going to happen? Bible says, then whoever calls on the name of Yahuwah will be saved. And so Apostle Peter is telling us 
the name Yahuwah is important because it shows us the people who have a true relationship with God. They're the ones who recognize his name, call upon his name, and that name is Yahuwah. And so the Bible tells us when that name is being proclaimed, when he awakens people to call upon that name, Yahuwah will begin to work in fulfilling the promise. And pretty soon all the earth will know the name Yahuwah. Because all the earth during the millennium, they're going to go to Jerusalem and they're going to worship Yahuwah and Yahushua. Question, who are those who will be the initial workers of proclaiming the, the name of Yahuwah? Well, remember, we quoted, Apostle Peter quoted the book of Joel. But Joel included something that Peter did not include here. And this is going to be informative because it tells us who will be the ones to proclaim the name of Yahuwah. Let's read the book of Joel, 2, 31, 32. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of Yahuwah. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name Yahuwah shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as Yahuwah has said, among the remnant whom Yahuwah calls. As the Bible says, there's going to be a remnant. There's always a remnant. Israel, is there a remnant of Israel? Yeah. Is there a remnant of the Ecclesia? Yeah. There's always going to be a remnant. The work of proclaiming the name Yahuwah will be done by a remnant of God's people. This is why, you know, this... I mean, not too long, when we first started proclaiming the name Yahuwah, there was not too many, not too many who called on the name of Yahuwah. Not too many who called on the name of Yahushua. Now, today, what have you seen? There's a big jump. There's an awakening of people from all different walks of life, from all different parts of people throughout the world, from Africa, from the United States, from the Philippines, from Europe, from Canada, everywhere. People are, what are they doing? They're calling upon the name of? Whose work is that? That's the work of Yahuwah. He's telling us it's almost that day when he is going to send his beloved son. Which means we have the responsibility to proclaim the name of Yahuwah. The fact that we are proclaiming the name of Yahuwah means that we are among the remnants whom Yahuwah has called. This is why the work that we do in the assembly of Yahushua is the work that is revealed by the prophecy of Scripture. There's a testimony of Scripture about the work of the assembly of Yahushua in preaching about the name Yahuwah and even the name Yahushua. A remnant. There's always going to be a remnant. And what's the proof that there's always a remnant? Let's read Zechariah. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is close to me. Who is the shepherd re uh, referred to here? Now, this is not a shepherd, but my shepherd. Why did he say my shepherd? He's close to me. <laughs> who else could that be? Yahusha, right? Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered, and I will turn my hand against the little ones. And so... Yahushua is the one being spoken of here. Yahushua was stricken. He was nailed to the cross and he was speared at his side. And when he died, when he was arrested, what happened to the sheep? Well, they all scattered. They all left him. Right? And I will turn my hand against the little ones. And the followers of Yahushua, they were persecuted. What else would happen? In the whole land, declares Yahuwah, two-thirds will be struck down and perish, and one-third will be left. Yeah. And so the whole land, representing the totality, and I believe the totality refers not just to the ecclesia, but even Israel. Totality, there, there's going to be many casualties, many people who will perish. There's many persecutions. The persecutions were ongoing, but there's going to be a third left in it. And the third... I will bring into the fire. I will refine them 
like silver and test them like gold. And so we have a third that's left. And the third goes through the fire. And when it goes through the fire, whatever's left is what is gold, right? And so what do you call that? What do you call the gold that's left of the one third? You call that a remnant. They go through the fire, they're called a remnant. The gold is the remnant. The gold is what is valuable. And the remnant, what will they do? They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. And they will say, Yahuwah is our God. Beloved brethren, we firmly believe that the work of the assembly of Yahushua is the work of the remnant whom God calls. This is why it's not surprising we call Yahuwah as our God. Yahushua is our Lord. We are practicing and rehearsing prophecy. We are called to do that. Just like Abraham, who was called to rehearse prophecy, to rehearse faith. We too are rehearsing prophecy. We are preparing for something big to come. And we prepare by calling on the name Yahuwah. Not only do we call the name Yahuwah, we also acclaim his name. We exalt his name. And those whom Yahuwah God invites to join him in this work of exalting the name of Yahuwah. Do you know who he wants to be included in this work? Do you know? Let's find out. Isaiah 24, 15, 14 and 15. They raise their voices. They shout for joy from the west. They acclaim Yahuwah's majesty. Therefore, in the east, give glory to the Lord. Exalt the name of Yahuwah, the God of Israel, in the islands of the sea. Yahuwah God is inviting all people to join this work from the west to the east, the islands of the sea. And this is the work of the assembly of Yahushua. This is why we don't stop. This is why we proclaim the name. And when we say we proclaim and exalt the name Yahuwah, we don't simply pronounce it. We preach its meaning. This is why we preach I am who I am. Ahaya, Asher, Ahaya. We preach Exodus 34, which tells us the character of Yahuwah, that he is unfailing love, faithful, long-suffering, patient, goodness, kindness comes from him. He's quick to forgive. That's what Yahuwah means. We exalt his name. We proclaim the name Yahuwah. We proclaim the name Yahushua. And we're invited. Yahuwah wants many to join this work that was begun by, that was done by the assembly of Yahushua, including those in the islands of the sea in the east. Who else could that be? Who else could that be? This is why we are also really emphasizing the work of people there in the Philippine Islands. Because you know what God wants them involved in this work of proclaiming the name Yahoo. Not just the people from the West, but also from the islands. They get a special mention for some reason. A special mention for the islands of the sea. Exalt the name. Yahuwah. And so when we are beginning to proclaim the name Yahuwah, do you know what that means? Let's read the book of 2 Peter, what was that? 119. And we have the word of the prophets made more certain. And you will do well to pay attention to it as a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. It's a dark day when the name of Yahuwah is not proclaimed. For many, many years, many centuries, the name Yahuwah was not proclaimed, right? But that's what he wants to happen. He wants his name to be proclaimed. But it was, it was covered by the very people he entrusted his name to. For many, many years, it was covered. But the Bible says there's a prophecy in Isaiah 52. There's a prophecy in the book of Psalms 104. The last generation, there will be people. There's a prophecy in the book of Acts, in the book of Joel, in the book and many other passages. There's a prophecy about a remnant who is going to bring, proclaim the name of Yahuwah. And so the darkness is going to allow for a light to begin to shine. 
That's where we are at now. But one day, that light is going to become a day, a whole day that dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. And so we need to keep proclaiming the name of Yahuwah. And this is the work of the Ascended of Yahushua, so that we can fulfill what Yahuwah's will and plan and purpose was in setting apart Israel. That my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. That's the work of the Assembly of Yahushua. And we invite you, beloved brethren, to join in this work. Let us proclaim the name of Yahuwah, the name of his beloved son, Yahushua HaMashiach. Okay? That is our lesson. Let us stand for our prayer. Most holy and gracious Abba Yahuwah, thank you, O loving Allahim in heaven. You are great indeed and loving, especially towards your people. You're always looking for one who is willing to obey you. Your eyes cross to and fro, looking for those whose hearts are loyal to you. We uh, want to be loyal to you, Father. Thank you for giving us a heart to desire what you desire. And so we proclaim your name. Your name, Yahuwah, with the best of our ability. We will never stop, even amidst persecution and opposition. Help us, Father, to be courageous and strong. Help us to proclaim your name forever and its purpose and meaning in our life. Our King Yahushua, we will also proclaim your name. For your name was given for salvation. Yahushua, our Savior, may you be with us. Thank you for calling us in this world allowing us to be included among the remnants who will proclaim light in the midst of darkness. Help us to rehearse our faith and to teach our fellow men to do likewise. Father, bless your people all over the world. We need your strength and power. We need your healing, O oh Abba. Heal your people throughout the world and prepare us for greatest work, greater works to come. We believe, Father, that you have listened to our prayers. For we ask and beg everything in the name of our Lord and Savior, Yahushua HaMashiach. Amen. Hey, brothers and sisters in the faith, uh, thank you so much for attending our Bible study for today. Uh, we do hope that you have benefited from this study and that you will continue to join us in proclaiming the name of the Father, Yahuwah, and His Son, Yahushua HaMashiach. That is all. Yahuwah Abba and Yahushua HaMashiach bless all of us.